Hello and welcome to the Second Tier Podcast. I'm Ryan Dilks and I'm joined by the Tommy Fury to my Tyson Fury. It's Justin Peach. Good day to you, Daddy Dilks. How are we doing? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's one of the most repulsive things i've ever heard in my life <laughs> and settling and settling way to start the show but there's there's context to the scenario and it might catch on we never know we hope <laughs> i hope not i I'd certainly appreciate it if you never caught me that again um and secondly i was wondering how long it would take for you to bring this up for anyone who hasn't seen this i tweeted on tuesday a screenshot of a reply on twitter from someone who called me daddy dilks um he said Daddy Dilks is always right, which I appreciate the sentiment, um, but I also hated being called Daddy Dilks, and I don't know how to respond to that. I think you should respond uh, by the way of getting it printed on the back of a shirt of your choice. You have plenty. You support multiple teams in the eyes of our listeners and, and followers on social, so take your pick with that. And obviously some certain type of number as well that draws a, draws a few raised eyebrows. So Daddy Dilks and, yeah, those those two numbers. <laughs> Just hearing you say Daddy Dilks <laughs> makes me cringe so much. You've really got my back up now. Incredible. Incredible. Oh, yeah, this is going to be a fun show. <laughs> well, it's got off to a terrible start, I can tell you that. Um, can I give you a question to start the episode, if that's all right, Justin? I, I Yeah, go on then. We, we love a question. What connects former Leicester defender Richie Delat, Catherine Hepburn, and John Bon Jovi? <laughs> Uh, they're not all Belgian. Um, they uh, they had they all once set foot in Leicester at some point in their lifetime. I tell you what, it's a good guess. It's really... Unfortunately, it's not right. The answer is absolutely fuck all. Okay, great. I thought there was going to be something interesting there. <laughs> <laughs> I was you had I just... me hooked. I just really wanted to see what you could come up with on the spot in a, such a short period of time. Uh, and the idea of Catherine Hepburn stepping foot into Leicester, I just don't think would have ever happened. I don't even know who Catherine Hepburn is. I was, I was on a whim there. She's a very famous, iconic like actor from the golden period of uh, the 50s and 60s, I think. You know about Audrey Hepburn? Who's Catherine Hepburn? Yeah, yeah, I'm no thinking idea. of Audrey Hepburn. Who's Catherine Hepburn? <laughs> right, I'll put it up in your face, <laughs> isn't it? Great. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Welcome to the number one championship <laughs> podcast, the second tier. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. Yes, this is a preview episode of the second tier where we're going to look ahead to the games coming up in the championship this coming weekend and make some predictions. We'll also talk about some of the news from the past few days. Plenty of interesting transfer tidbits that have been happening in the second tier over the past few days. Then we'll finish off with Scott High or Ryan Lowe right at the end of the show. So let's have a look ahead to the weekend. So in each preview episode of the second tier, Justin and I each pick a banker, a team we think is guaranteed to win this coming weekend, as well as an outsider. So someone we think is going to win, but is bigger odds with the bookies than their opponent. We're tracking how we do as the season goes on. One point for a correct banker, two points for an outsider. Whoever loses has to do a forfeit, which will be a CrossFit workout for myself, while Justin has to do a coach trip from Sunderland to Plymouth and back, which we figured out last week is something like 48 hours long, which is going to be fun. That's not even taken into account Justin having to go from Derby to Sunderland. Um, The current scores are 4-3 to myself, Justin and I each got our bankers correct last weekend, but not our outsiders. So just a one point gap still separates the two of us. Justin Peach, who is your banker for the weekend? I'm on a roll at the moment. I think I've got two in a row. So let's let's make it three. We've got two. I've I've gone with... No, I haven't. No, you haven't. I'm not on a roll. You got your outsider (laughs) right on the first weekend. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I've got some of our predictions right, which is more than I could say about last year. Uh, but I've gone with Leicester City to win away at Rotherham. It's quite an interesting fixture, this, for me, for, for several reasons. I think I don't, we mentioned it at the weekend show. Leicester haven't quite hit their mojo or got their mojo. I don't really know how to phrase that. But they're still building into things is pretty much what I'm saying. There's a lot of individual ability and quality. That's been the main catalyst of their win so far. And they're yet to really own a game. 
which is to be expected under Maresca, um, coming in over the summer and it being a virtually new squad to play with. Um, and to, to, to mix that in, they, they've been drawing at half-time in each of their championship fixtures so far, so there's, there's more room for them to improve. Then you couple it, a couple of the factor in that Matt Taylor has some serious issues at Rotherham. Personnel-wise, the quality just isn't there that we've highlighted. On numerous occasions, they've conceded a heavy volume of chances and they're coming up against a side who boasts the quality that Leicester do. It's, you know, it's quite an easy one to see why Leicester are favourites for this one and it's probably an easy pick as to why I've picked them for I've chosen for for, for my banker. I, I do I do think Robin will pick up, but I just can't see them getting past Leicester on the, uh, well, this weekend because I say that that strength that Leicester boast, yes, yeah, it's, it's just too high. Yeah, Leicester and Rotherham, the difference in quality in terms of a player and it, difference in terms of resources is massive, absolutely massive, isn't it? And I think this is one of two very obvious picks for this weekend. Um, I was having a look at Rotherham's underlying data from the first three games. bit concerning, having said that, their underlying data last season wasn't very good either, and they still managed to stay up relatively comfortably in the end. So maybe we shouldn't get too dragged down in it, but I don't think they've had the greatest of starts, even though sending offs haven't helped with that. Um, but yeah, it's very hard to disagree with you on this one, Justin. I've gone for the other um, pretty obvious banker for the weekend. Um, I will say just before we start, uh, Audrey Hepburn and Catherine Hepburn, both actresses from the same period. Not sure if they're related, but I wasn't getting <laughs> the two mixed up from the sound of it. Um, <laughs> Southampton to win at home to QPR is my banker for this coming weekend. Seven points from three games for Southampton. On paper, a great start. The fact is, though, they haven't been outstanding so far, I would say. They impressed against Wednesday, but struggled to create many chances. Against Norwich, it was defensive blunder after defensive blunder. And then then against Plymouth, they were slightly fortunate because, in my view, Plymouth could have very easily won that. Despite that, they're getting results. And that's because the individual quality they have is shining through. They've got the highest expected goals going forwards in the division, as you've been very much made aware on social media this week, Justin. And they have enough talents in their ranks to seriously hurt teams, especially against QPI. It's going to take a while for Southampton to really start rolling. But the early signs have been... Good, certainly. Uh, QPR coming off the back, what I think was their best performance of the season so far against Ipswich. They lost, but were perhaps unlucky not to get something from the game. Despite that, they're not a match for Southampton. There's a chance we could see a championship record for possession in this game. Two teams with vastly contrasting styles. Southampton like to play the possession game. QPR don't. Um, I honestly would not be surprised to see something like 85% possession to Southampton here and see all sorts of passing records um, thrown out the window by this game. Um, But whatever the case, I fancy a Southampton win. I just think even though the performances haven't been incredible so far, they're still getting results on the board. Their their, Their attacking quality is just proving too much for teams. And I just think when you compare the two squads in this particular game, then Southampton are a much superior side to QPR. I, I agree that Southampton are a much superior side to QPR, but I, I disagree. Based on a lot of the research I've done to back up some of my points to those Southampton fans disagreeing with the notion that I just don't think Southampton have been that great so far this season. I, I, I'm i going to go straight in there. I'm picking QPR as my outside, uh, outsider for this weekend. Yeah. I think QPR's strengths are going to really play into Southampton's weaknesses here. And I don't think you've given QPR quite enough credit this season, which is, you know, you do you, Ryan. But Gareth Ainsworth with his tight jeans, cowboy boots, he's going to be licking his lips this weekend and ready to give you a middle finger as soon as he pulls off this 1-0 win that I think they're going to pull off against against Southampton. Don't think that will happen, but here's hoping. Um I've 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 been made well not made made aware. Southampton attacking stats are, they speak for themselves, but defensively, defensive transitions being countered against is a major major weakness for Southampton. And there's no way Gareth Ainsworth is not going to set up his side up to to exploit those weaknesses. You've got to give him credit; he's very good at being under the cosh, putting on the tin hat, being under the cosh, weathering a storm, and getting a surprise result here and there. You look at Burnley away last season at Turf Moor, for example, is a key example of that. 
And I think the Southampton team has got a lot more weaknesses than that Burnley team to be exploited. Sinclair Armstrong's in a really nice vein of form. Last two games, he's performed really, really well. And I actually think the way Southampton are going to play is going to play into QPR's hands. It's a tight pitch at Loftus Road. The fans are going to be on. Uh, the fans are the fans are going to be up for it. And the type we'll of football out there, it's play. not like, like it's not Loftus Road for a start. What is it? It's at St Mary's. Is it? It yes. is at St Mary's. Well, let's change that again. I'm still going to back QPR though. I'm, I am still going to back QPR because I still think they're going to uh, deploy the same principles um, as Norwich did. Uh, I don't think the home home factor is going to play into this for QPR at all. But as I say, defending set of pieces as well. So that Southampton completely, completely hopeless. And I think QPR, Gareth Rainsworth, his team's going to be, his, they're going to be up for this one. They might be up for it, Justin, but I just don't think the technical quality between the two is even comparable. It doesn't matter. Passing stats do not win you games. We've seen this. All the possession in the world will not win you a game. You've got to be clinical, and I don't think Southampton are there yet. I think they will be at some point, but I don't think they're there yet, and I think QPR are going to punish that major factor that is clearly a weakness for Southampton at the moment. Well, you, you are right. Passing stats don't win you games, but at the same time, I think you saying the clinical nature isn't there for them yet is just nonsense because as we have seen well they have the highest expected goals for in the division and have scored the second most goals in the division that sounds pretty good to me and at the end of the day Justin when it comes to football matches the idea is to outscore your opponents and I think when it comes to that Southampton are gonna do QPR for all the chances Southampton have been creating they've not been putting them away to narrowly beat Sheffield Wednesday 2-1 isn't indicative of that a massive amount of chances they created during that game. Failed to overcome Norwich despite creating a shed load of chances and only just scraped through against Plymouth despite creating a shed load of chances. That's not being clinical. And as I say, I think this QPR team is going to weather that storm. They're going to hit Southampton on the break. Based on what? Based on the way Gareth Ainsworth has always set up his teams, based on the fact that St. Clair Armstrong is in a really good run of form, they did the same thing against Cardiff. I know it's Cardiff and I know it's a different opponent. That was a very different game. Very yeah, different yeah. game because Cardiff, even though they had loads of possession in that and QPR were happy to let them have possession, they had no cutting edge whatsoever. Southampton have shown that they do. They haven't, though. They absolutely haven't shown well, that. Well, they have because they, they haven't. won two games and drawn one. <laughs> And scored they four have. goals in the one that they've drawn. I, I don't think they've shown that they've got a cutting edge just yet. And I think this is going to it's be... They've got the second most goals in the division. That sounds like a cutting edge, Justin. Compared they've got the highest the expected creating. goals for in the division. That oh, sounds like a cutting edge. Day. We can all... I, I don't think it is. They might be creating those chances, How is he but not? I don't think they're putting them away. Because they're not putting their opposition away. And they give opposition chances. And QPR will take them. They are desperate for goals and points. They will take them. I will fully accept that Southampton have been very shaky defensively. But at the end of the day, as I say, the aim is to score more goals than your opponent. And Southampton have been doing that fine this season so far. Three games in, but still. I, I just, I don't think they have. And I, and, I, and I said it all at the weekend as well. They've got two wins from three games. I, I'm How well have aware they not? That. Because, again, the amount of chances they've been creating, the amount of possession that they had, they haven't dominated games. They haven't stopped opposition from they creating chances. They have been chances. dominating games. They haven't. They absolutely haven't. You we've cannot the dominate. you possession in the division, Justin. Congratulations. Possession not does not mean you're dominating. It. No, no, no. Possession does not mean you're dominating a football match. If you are allowing your opposition to create as many chances as they have been, you are not dom- dominating game because the opposition will have a chance to score against Southampton. In the last three games, that's been shown. And it's not going to change overnight, is it? QPR will get chances. They, they might have a, the line share of possession, but they will give QPR chances to score goals. Simple. We'll leave that one there because we're not getting anywhere at all. Um, my outsider for this weekend then is Stoke to win away at Millwall. Uh, first of all, I will say it was really difficult picking an outsider for this weekend, much more difficult than it has been over the past couple of weeks. Um, so this wasn't one that I was massively fond on, but I think it's the most likely outsider of all the games this weekend, um, particularly QPR against Southampton. Um, but I find myself opposing Millwall because I am slightly worried. They kicked off the season with a great win over Middlesbrough. The last two games have been poor, though. 
And that's led to the somewhat familiar calls from certain Millwall fans for Gary Rowett to get sacked. There were a chance during the Norwich game at the weekend. It's not ideal. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday, the only side to have a poorer expected goals going forwards than Millwall. I think that's down to a couple of things. One of them being individuals not being up to form at the moment. Zion Fleming just hasn't got going yet. Kevin Nisbet has had an underwhelming start. Uh, also wasn't helped by them having to play Duncan Watmore at left wing back at the weekend either. And I think that idea got badly exposed. But look, I, I think Millwall will be fine and probably finish around where they usually finish. It feels like they're missing something if they want to go that bit further. But hey, transfer window is still open. That doesn't help them with regards to this game. I think Stoke can make the most of Millwall's slack start. It's been a decent start for the Potters. They look as if they've got a bit more about them than they have in recent seasons. I'm a big fan of both Ben Walmart and Luke McNally at the back. Keanu Hoivers, a superb wing back. Andre Vidi goal has been an excellent goal scoring form. And I just get the sense that there could be a bit of pent up frustration from Millwall fans that could spill out if things aren't going their way. Stoke fans also aren't huge admirers of Gary Rowett and so could have themselves a very joyful Saturday afternoon if they were to really twist the knife in this one. So, yeah, I'm going for a Stoke win against Mule. What do you think, Justin? I think, yeah, I think the biggest loser of this game, if Stoke win, is probably going to be Gary Rowett because, as you say, you're going to have a whole stadium, all four stands probably in unison. <laughs> not, Not being particularly complimentary of Gary Rowett, shall we say this, which I don't think is particularly fair, but that's a, that's another argument for another day. Um, but I completely agree with you, which is obviously a slightly anticlimactic after our significant debate on Southampton QPR. But I, I do agree with you. I don't think Millwall fully know how they can get the best out of themselves, which is quite poor when we're heading into the fourth game of the season. Mix that with Stoke having a very nice-looking squad. Andre Vidigol, as you've already pointed out, They've got some. They've got a really nice balance to them now, which I don't think we've been able to say for probably three years, four years, maybe even longer. Um, not necessarily on the podcast, just generally not being able to say that Stoke look a well balanced team, but they look a well balanced team now, and I think that's going to play into the hands because at least Alex Neal's got round pegs in round holes now, as opposed to playing wingers at wing back, etc. So yeah, I think Stoke are in a better position to to go and get a result when they've got players in form as well, which Millwall just just don't. So yeah, you've got two clubs in completely different phases. Stoke on the up, Millwall just a big question mark at the moment. Yeah, been a very promising start to the season for Stoke City. And we'll talk about them in the news, Justin, because they've made a very interesting signing from Italy. So we'll talk about that after the break. Welcome back to the Second Tier Podcast. Now it's time for this. Yes, it's time for the news. And Willie Nonto has returned to first team training at Leeds after he submitted a transfer request last week. Daniel Farker revealed last week that he was training away from the main group of players and banished from the dressing room. But the 19-year-old has returned to the fold after talks with Farker and chief exec Angus Kinnear. Not sure if this necessarily means that he's definitely staying at Leeds past the transfer window closing, but do you think this might be the signalling of the end of this saga, Justin? I think the signalling of the end of the saga was Everton getting absolutely panned at the weekend by Villa. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, but I, I do hope it is. I've told told you, told all of you, it's better to forgive and forget than to hate and grow bitter. And we're, we're moving on. still disagree with you <laughs> on this one, Justin. I still think they should get rid. And even though oh. Leeds have been so adamant about keeping hold of him and have seemingly been inclined to get him back into the first team, you know, picture, I, I still think it's really poor form from him. And I don't think that should just be easily forgotten. He, he's clearly not bothered about playing for Leeds. He's disrespected the club, he's the fans, his teammates, the manager. Is he going to be as motivated when he's out on the pitch as someone like... Uh, Sam Greenwood, for example, who's a young lad playing in a similar position, trying to make an impression. I think going forwards, I'd still much rather get rid of someone like Nonto, either bring someone else in or give someone like Sam Greenwood a chance. I, uh, I mean, we've we disagreed on this already um, in, in the weekend episode. I, I just think it's it's 19. Well, I what, think it's, just, it's, it's, what would you disagree with me on there then? I don't think it. I don't think they should just get rid of him just because he's had this little saga. I think. He's got to recognise that he's a kid. He's 19 years old. 
and he's being guided by his really agents. Though, just I do. Th- I, I do. I do. I, I think you can't. You can't take for granted just how young the, the, the lad is, and a leader of a big football club. And he's just, again. I repeat. I think he's been given some poor advice, and I don't think he's not going to be motivated going into games. I think he's going to hit the Thin? ground running. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think that. Okay. 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 Who do you think is going to be more motivated if you were to put them in Leeds' game this weekend? Sam Greenwood or Willie Nonto? I, well, I don't think it'd be about motivation. Sam Greenwood could be incredibly motivated, but his quality might not be very good. Will uh, Nonto could be half motivated and still get a better output because he's just a better player. I'm not sure that would be the case. Uh, well, th- th- that's, it's neither here nor there, is it? All I can say is that I think no, Nonto no, is being given the chance. Is not there, Justin, because at the end of the day... If if a play if you t- if you're putting out a player who's extremely talented but he's half motivated then that's not good form is it and it doesn't exactly send a good example to someone like Sam Greenwood I, I know he's been dragged into this when he's done absolutely nothing wrong but he's an example that we're using what kind of an example does that say to him that okay you've you're a young lad who's trying to make an impression on the manager and you've got this player who's essentially thrown his toys out of the pram disrespected everyone at the club and said, right, we're going to play him instead of you. I don't, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think Nonto is just going to be eased, eased into things because he's got to deal with the crowd. But this is the thing about football. Nonto puts in three performances, scores three match-winning goals. Everybody forgets within a couple of weeks. That's just how it is. Um, and if it earns him a move in January that everybody's happy with, because that's the key thing here. If, if Leeds are willing to sell, then, then Nonto goes. It's as simple as that. If they're not, then he stays. And I think that's really what you've got to take into notion. And I think as well, you've got to remember that these footballers, they're treated like assets at football clubs. So whilst Nanto wants to leave, um, if he I don't know, picks up an injury and gets released at the end of a contract or, or whatever, whatever the scenario would be, then you know, Leeds, Leeds would be willing to do so. Um, I just think that you know, you've got to you've got to give him an olive olive branch, especially when he's this young. If it was someone who's twenty eight and highly paid and doing that, then they're fair enough. But he's nineteen years sure old. He is highly paid. He probably is highly paid, but he's he's just a kid. He's nineteen years old. You've got to recognise that. Would you be happy if someone did that at Derby? If a nineteen year old, twenty year old, whatever, threw his toys out and basically said, "No, don't want to play for this club anymore," and then would you welcome him back in with open arms to Derby County? I've, I've, well, not open arms, but it would be a tentative. Right, let's see what he does. If he puts out, if he puts performances on the pitch, then then fair enough. If he's showing that he's willing and he's working, then absolutely fair enough. I wouldn't forgive and forget it, but I'll certainly forgive it for now and make sure you put the work in, sort of thing. It's that. It's that's that's how, that's how football works. It changes so quickly. I don't think that should be the case. I think if Leeds are going to get a load of money for him, then may as well cash in now, get someone else in who actually does want to play for Leeds United. I don't think it's that easy at this point in the transfer window. Simple as that. Leeds have got to suck it up and, and go with it and try and convince him that Leeds, Leeds is going to be the club for him for the next six months. Mm, not sure about that. I'm very curious to see how the Leeds fans react if he does play for them again anyway. That'll be interesting to see. That's the one thing that I am supportive. That's the only reason I am slightly supportive of Nanto staying, just to see that reaction, to see... How that would uh, how that one would go down. Ipswich is set to sign Manchester United defender Brandon Williams, according to numerous sources. It's a loan with a buy option. Quite an exciting move. This my initial thought when I saw this move was why are Ipswich signing a left back? They've got Leif Davis, who's one of the best in the division for my money, but he's actually right footed. Is Williams and was orig- he was initially a right back when he was first coming through at Man United. It wasn't until a coach told him, why don't you ever go at left back? Then he started playing there. Can you guess who that coach was, Justin? Was it Kieran McKenna? It was Kieran McKenna. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely right. Um, And it seems like when you look at Ipswich's starting 11s from the first few weeks of the season, that there's quite an obvious gap in that Ipswich team at right back. And that's where I imagine Brandon Williams will go. Yes, I it is a bit of a left field one. I think he's going to be probably more of a versatile squad option, giving Ipswich the depth that right wing back really? and left wing back. Yeah, I he's not played. He didn't play one game last season and had a really poor loan spell at Norwich the season before, albeit Premier hang League on, top hang flight. On, hang on, hang on. <laughs> really poor loan spell. He won. He came third in their Player of the Season award. I'm just going by what Norwich fans have said on social. To be fair, but 
well, it's, Justin, it's... <laughs> come on now. Surely, surely you're not that naive. He's just gone yeah, to there's a, the Yeah, there's rivals. a bit of bias there. <laughs> that definitely plays into it. That being said, he's, he's not. He played one game last season. So that, that's still that's still a. That, that was factor. down to injury, though. Let's just make that clear as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it takes time to to get back to it. So to expect him to be an automatic starter, I think, is yeah, probably naive, as you say. Leaf Davis is the attacking element of if switches wing backs and then you've got Harry Clark on the other side who's a who's a more defen- defensive option that's a, you know quite a bit of balance so I do think Brandon Williams isn't going to be an automatic starter it's, he's going to have to show his worth in that team I don't think you can expect him to oust someone as good as Leif Davis and, and someone as solid as Harry Clark straight away um I'm not sure about that at all, Justin. We're talking about someone who's 22 and has played nearly 50 games in the Premier League. So he's he's clearly a very talented boy. Yeah, that might be the case. But as I say, he's got a lot of football to catch up on. A lot of football to catch up on and uh, certainly a lot to prove as well, considering, well, I wouldn't say, just some speculative, poor uh, decision-making on social media, um, which is which was, he was reprimanded for. Uh, by United, but I think he's got a lot to What's prove. That got to do with anything? It, it just comes across as a well, co- well, a of just in May. I remind you, he's young. We've got to forgive them for these kind of things. <laughs> Such a dick. <laughs> Using that against me already. Look, no, you're look, you're absolutely right. Look, you're absolutely right. But he's got time. He's to play. a really well. He's a really talented player. I really rate him. And if you look at his underlying data from his time at Norwich, really impressive for someone who was only 20 at the time. And if you take a more balanced view of it and look at what Norwich journalists were saying at the time and ignore what fans are saying now, then they were talking really highly about him. And I think that's a a better way of looking at how Brandon Williams did at Norwich than looking at what the fans are saying about him now. Defensively, he's great. Was also really good at carrying the ball forwards. Last season, didn't go out on loan. He was injured for virtually half the season and then, you know, getting in that Man United was always going to be a struggle. But Ipswich getting getting him in potentially permanently as well. He's really exciting. Leif Davis one side, Williams on the other, really whets the appetite for me. And I now look at that Ipswich team and as I was just saying at the weekend, they need a defender and another attacker. Here's that defender, get another attacker. It's difficult to pick a weakness in that Ipswich side for me. I completely agree that the, there are very few weaknesses and Brandon Williams is certainly going to add to the depth of the squad uh, and quality overall. Uh, it's a very tidy looking squad. Maybe need another forward. I think I said this the other day. Need another forward, but overall, yeah, McKenna's cooking something very, very nice. Yes, as I've been saying. Um, Southampton have signed midfielder Flynn Downs on loan from West Ham until the end of the season. I will point out that I said this time last year that I didn't think he was ready for the Premier League. Looks like I was right. It's not to say he isn't a talented player and he could be a great signing for Southampton, I think. I completely agree. Uh, just to add to that, to say he's a ready, very replacement for Declan Rice is quite mad from some Swansea fans considering that Declan Rice was a world-class player. I'll just add that in there. Uh, but he's certainly got a hell of a lot of potential. And I think another season in the Championship is going to serve him well, especially a team that is going to be pushing for the top six. Spoke at length about Southampton's frailties uh, promotion, I should say. Spoke at length about Southampton's frailties defensively. Flynn Downs is going to remedy that. Maybe not quickly, but he's going to remedy that, remedy that in the long term. He's a tidy passer, likes to get the ball into the final third as well. Got all the uh, all the all the ingredients you need as a uh, as a central defensive midfielder who likes to play play through the third. So yeah, it's a it's a really good signing. I couldn't see if it was with a view to a permanent though. I'd be surprised if it wasn't. I think it's just a loan. I think. Mm. Well, um, go on. I was going to say, but well, it might be that ready-made replacement for Rice. But yeah, it would be daft for West Ham to allow him to to go out with a view to a permanent because he's a top, he's a top, top talent. Yeah, well, he, he possibly would get more game time now if Declan Rice had left West Ham last season, and he could still be the long-term successor. But he now needs to show what he can do during this loan. Uh, I think he's a very intelligent player for someone who's still fairly young at 24, very good at reading the game, winning the ball back, finding a teammate. Gives their midfield a bit more balance at Southampton. I say that because when everyone's fit, I imagine Wilson Martin's first choice midfield will be Stuart Armstrong, Carlos Alcaraz. They're missing someone who would do the dirty work and complement those two players and some of the more creative players around them. You've got Shay Charles, who might be able to do that in the long term, but right now he's still a bit young. So it makes sense to get Downs in. Russell Martin, 
knows him well. And uh, it just makes complete sense, if you ask me. I, I'm, I don't think it's a, with a view to a permanent Justin Boot. And I think that may say something about how West Ham view him in the long term as potentially the long term successor to Declan Rice, if he can uh, step up his game. Because as we were alluding to, I think it was a bit too soon for him to move to the Premier League last season. And now getting some championship football at the top level is going to really, uh, really do him good. I'm also quite enjoying, by the way, Russell Martin making Southampton into a Swansea 2.0. Flynn Downs coming in. Ryan Manning's already there. Nathan Wood's been linked, as has Joel Pirro. Really is just cherry picking the best of Swansea for the past couple of years, isn't he? Yeah, mid-table Swansea team. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah, if I'm if I'm going to be sceptical there and, and, and a bit of a cynic, well, let's be honest. The, the Southampton, uh, Southampton, Swansea, they are mid-table, but they have got some very talented players, haven't they? It's just been yeah, getting yeah. the balance right there. And I mean, they're also linked with Matt Grimes uh, earlier in the summer as well. So he, he, Russell Martin, really has been going him, 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 and him. Um, and so far, it's worked quite well. But if they'll get Cal Norton in as well, uh, Taylor Garda Hickman <laughs> has moved to Bristol City on loan from West Brom. There's the option for Bristol City to make the move for the 20 year old, 21 year old midfielder, a permanent one. It will reportedly cost just £1.3 million if they want to do so. I don't get this move from a West Brom perspective at all. A really talented young player who West Brom are potentially willing to let go for just over a million pounds. Doesn't make sense to me. I know they're not in the greatest place financially. I get that. But this is one of their most sellable assets. And he's going for what is a relative pittance in today's money. It feels like West Brom are shooting themselves in the foot with this one. Don't get me wrong. Absolute bargain for Bristol City. A great deal for them. But what are West Brom doing? I think it's West Brom in three years might look back and go, why did we do that? Because it depends. Look at that now saying, why are they doing that? <laughs> yeah, there's, there is that. And they obviously, they already do have a, a slim squad as it is. They do have some depth in midfield, but they are older players, whereas Gardner Hickman obviously is in a very nice age bracket at 21 years old. It is a bit of a weird move, but then you sort of coincide that with the fact that he's probably been more of a squad player under Carlos Colbrand, who I feel like looking from the outside in has maybe never been convinced by him, by Gardner Hickman as a whole package. He only made 11 starts last season, for example, a lot of, lot of minutes off the bench. Did average 2.99 tackles, basically three tackles per 90, which would have put him in the highest bracket for championship midfielders last season. Maybe would have decreased, increased with his numbers, but there's a lot there to for him to grow on. I think Nigel Pearson and Bristol City have pulled off a bit of a corker there because I do think in in a few years' time he will be a good signing. How many how many versatile midfielders does Nigel Pearson need? By the way, at Bristol City they've got Jason Knight, Mark Sykes, Ross McCurry, and now Gordon Hickman who can all play at right wing back. <laughs> Incredible. Not not a bad position to be in, is it? <laughs> but look, I rate Carlos Corbran as a manager, but I think he's got this one wrong. I've seen enough of Gardner Hickman in the last year and a bit to see this lad has a lot of talent. His underlying data is also really quite promising for someone of his age. If Corbran doesn't rate him, then I think that's more of a Carlos Corbran problem than a Gardner Hickman problem. Maybe, but it also might have come from the top as well because we know that West Brom need the money. So selling a squad player for, for this amount... Uh, whether that's just over a million, just, just yeah, no. a million. Yeah, it does, it does make you wince a little bit because there's always that factor of what if they get really good and we could have sold him for seven or eight million pounds next season, for example. I just don't think it, you know, it just comes down to Corbrand probably favouring the more experienced players, which, as you say, is probably just a Corbrand thing. Um, but West Brom, three years' time, that, that's, where it, that's where it might hurt them. That's where it might hurt them. Maybe not this season, but... Yeah, three years time where they could have got a big fee. Yeah, they might they might uh, might regret that move. There are plenty of other midfielders at West Brom right now who they should be looking to get off the wage bill more than someone like a young prospect like Gardner Hickman, someone like Mowat and Chalabar, players who just haven't really featured Harder to much shift under Carlos Harder to shift. Harder to shift, I accept, but still you should be looking to get rid of them instead of selling players who ultimately could be worth five times the price that they're potentially getting rid of 
uh, them for now. It doesn't make sense to me. Stoke have signed Algeria international Mehdi Leris for an undisclosed fee from Sampdoria. The 25-year-old made 29 starts in Serie A last season, but Samp did finish bottom of the league. He's traditionally a winger, but was playing as a wing-back last season. Some of his teammates from last season, Justin, Fabio Quagliarella, Manolo Gabbiadini, Jesse Rodriguez, that's the mad one who used to play for PSG and Real Madrid. <laughs> and of course, Harry Winks. Just thought I'd let you in on that because I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, Leris looks a very interesting signing, doesn't he? Because mm-hmm. I assume he won't be playing at wing back because it seems like Kiana, Kiana Hoiver has that one nailed down. But yeah, from what I've read, looks very interesting. It does. I know absolutely nothing about him, but I read that he's six foot one. And I looked at his aerial stats, which were the highest bracket for mm. uh, right-sided players in, in Syria. At 25, he's a really nice age bracket as well. So in my eyes, you th- I'm thinking Mark Travers, get the ball, hoist it to the right side. Leris beats the left wing back to the header, flicks it on for this, Tyrese Campbell. This is why you're such a Gareth Ainsworth <laughs> fanboy all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, I've got my cowboy boots on as well as we record. Hair's growing out long and I'm going to dye it too. Um, but yeah, I'm just sort of mouse watering at the Route 1 style that could potentially happen with this transfer. I don't think it will, but those are, they are nice numbers and a nice option to have on the right-hand side because he's, he's an outlet and it gives you the opportunity to play percentages, percentages and he has that versatility as well, the ability to play right wing, backhand winger, gives him cover for Hoiver and the option to go to a 4-2-3-1, as Neil has done already this season. So, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting signing. I really want to see how this one plays out. Might even go and see him, just become a Laris fanboy, just because he's a six foot one winger, which you don't get often enough now. <laughs> Did you ever get it? I'm trying to think of, I mean, Thierry Henry, if you could class him as a, as a winger, because he was a bit of an inside forward. He was six foot one. Yeah, they're, they're very rare. I mean, any Stoke players as well that were during the Tony, Tony Pulis era, they must have been six foot plus. They weren't. No, they weren't very tall though, were they? I think you're looking at like Mario Mandzukic as the ideal uh, mm. example of a wide target man, to use a football manager term. Um, but look, I, I was looking at his underlying data from last season. Looks impressive. Despite him playing in a Sampdoria team, which only got 19 points all season, it seems like he was one of the standout players for them. So perhaps a bit unlucky that he didn't get a move to another Serie A side. And as far as right-sided players go, he was certainly in the top half of, you know, top half performing right-sided players. So from what I've read, looks an exciting signing, brilliant carrying the ball forwards, but also capable defensively. Might need to improve his discipline a bit. He got the most yellow cards in the whole of Serie A last season, uh, which is some going. But judging on a purely data perspective, for me, it seems quite surprising that Stoke have managed to get him because it seems like he should be playing at a higher level than the Championship. Well, whether that, that, might, that might be the case is what I'm trying to say, but I think it just highlights just how shrewd Stoke have been this summer with Jared Dublin at the helm little bit of structure off the pitch and the recruitment has already been miles better than it has been in years gone by. And you are right, maybe you should have got a higher move, but Stoke are a big club, well-backed club as well. And he's clearly buying into the project that Alex Neal is trying to deploy there. So, yeah, re- really looking forward to it. I disagree with you. I don't think he should improve his discipline because if you've got a shit-ass playing on right wing that you can pump the ball into, I am here for it. <laughs> oh, Ainsworth fanboy. Um <laughs> Yeah, um, the only thing I would follow on from what you were just saying then, Justin, the recruitment has certainly been a lot more impressive than it has been, Hunter, and I think that does deserve a big round of applause. I don't think every player they've brought in this summer is going to be a success, but certainly four or five players there, really, really top signings. Coventry have signed midfielder Yanis Ayari on loan from Brighton. The 19-year-old moved to the Amex in January of this year from AIK in Sweden for £4 million. The question is, is he the new Gustavo Hamer? Is he the man who they brought in to replace him? Obviously difficult to say. He only made a handful of appearances for Brighton so far and there isn't much to base him on from that perspective what we can say is this is Brighton we're talking about Brighton's recruitment is some of the best in the world if they've spent four million pounds on him then that leaves me excited at 
how talented a player this could be. If, well, look at it. No club is better at finding gems in the dirt from around the world than Brighton. It's not like, you know, a scattergun approach, throwing anything at the wall and seeing what sticks. It's clever, calculated recruitment. But I'm sure we all know that by now. And if he's playing first team games, albeit a small amount like he was last season, then I'd say that's promising as well. They clearly see something in this lad. And Coventry's recruitment team in itself is also excellent. And they clearly think the lad can bring something to the team. So, well, we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket. I don't think we should be surprised to see this lad turn out to be an unbelievable player. Well, I saw his numbers at AIK before he moved to Brighton. He scored four from 14 shots on target from 15 starts. So he's clearly got an eye for goal. It's not probably not going to replace Hamer directly, but he's going to replace that element that's gone to Yorkshire with Hamer and that's scoring goals from midfield, which they're probably not going to get from Josh Eccles and, and Ben Sheaf. They're just not that type of midfielder. They might get one or two, but they're just not a type of midf- that type of midfielder. Don't think Jamie Allen can rep- replicate the scoring exploits he managed last season either. So he adds that dimension, that Coventry do clearly need. And you are right, Brighton are really good at recruiting. Um, look forward to seeing him in a Chelsea shirt in three years' time when they inevitably sign him for £90 million pounds as well. Um, but as well as that, Coventry City are also really good at identifying talent and bringing that in. So just a thumbs up all round. And it'll be nice to see how this one progresses throughout the season because, as you say, Coventry are also very good at bringing players in. So, yeah, two clubs that are good at doing it, bring a player in, work together on it. It's going to be a good signing, maybe. Yeah, if this is two clubs whose recruitment we both rate incredibly highly and they've both given this guy a thumbs up, that's usually a good sign from my point of view. And finally, you may have seen a Norwich fan received online abuse after giving an interview before their game against Millwall on Sunday. A bunch of weirdos were making stupid comments about him on Twitter. But the footballing community is now rallied around the lad called Nathan West. He's running a half marathon for charity and his fundraiser was at £44,000. The last time I checked, his target was 500 quid. And then since then, in a few days, he's now raised £44,000, which I just think is a nice story that shows the football community is by and large a good place. It's just that there's a few wankers who make stupid comments to impress their imaginary friends. But um, uh, did you keep across this story, Justin? Yeah, absolutely. He's he's a genuine football fan. And obviously, he was trying to keep up to date with the Women's World Cup final while the Norwich Millwall game was on. And what he was saying was was pretty accurate, uh, to be fair. And raising money is hard. And he's obliterated his original target of £500 for cancer research. He's just a a man with a kind heart doing a good thing. So definitely go donate. Yeah, we'll put a link to Nathan's fundraiser in the description of this episode if anyone does want to donate. Right, now it's time for this. Scott High or Ryan Lowe? Best. He's a fucking shit, mate. Yes, it's time for Scott High or Ryan Low. This is the game where we have to rank four things from highest to lowest. Simple as that. There's three questions. This week, Justin, I'll be providing the questions for you. Are you ready, Peachy Boy? Absolutely. I'm not going to kick off like you do every week, so let's go. I don't kick off with this because I think this game is just absolutely <laughs> fine. It's just when you give me stupid questions on Simon Grayson Take for Late. Uh, or Simon Grayson gives me stupid questions. Um, the first question is this. Rank these four players on which one has had the most loan spells while on loan from Chelsea. Hmm. Those players are Lewis Baker, Patrick Bamford, Ryan Bertrand and Scott Sinclair. Ooh, he's a good... Pat Bamford, uh, Ryan Burt, Scott Sinclair. Uh, I'm going to go in hot. I'm going to go Scott Sinclair top, then Lewis Baker, then Pat Bamford, then Ryan Bertrand. I mean, you're not far off, but you've also oh. butchered it. <laughs> oh, okay. So what you've done is you've got Bertrand and Sinclair the wrong way round. Really? Apart from that, you, apart from that you're absolutely correct. Uh, what? Bertrand more than Scott Sinclair. I think Scott Sinclair had like nine, didn't he? Ryan Bertrand had nine. Lewis Baker had eight. Bamford seven. Sinclair six. Shit. I see, thought Sinclair see, what, was what you pretty think, What you're forgetting, what you're forgetting is Scott Sinclair was still fairly young when he moved to Swansea. But, and was that permanent or was it Villa he moved permanently to? No, Swansea was permanent. Swansea yeah. was permanent. And he was still fairly young. Bertrand was still on loan from Chelsea when he was like... Phew, Mid to late twenties, one to. Mm, that's a good point. That is a good point. That surprised me though. That is probably, he's a left back. Left backs are short, short supply uh, post two thousand. 
<laughs> Good player, know. Ryan Bertrand. Don't tell Leicester fans that, but he is. Um, so that's a bad start for you, Justin. The next question is all about Steve Bruce. Can you rank these clubs by which one he has managed the most games for? Those clubs are Aston Villa, Newcastle, Sunderland, and Wigan. What is shit spells? There are many. Um, <laughs> Villa, Newcastle, Sunderland, Wigan. Uh, you say managed most games for? Yes. So most games um, managed at the top. It was at Wigan for a season because Sunderland paid. No, Wigan paid. I saw him paid like a world record fee for a, a um, English again. record fee. Um, so Wigan are bottom, then Villa, then Newcastle, then Sunderland. No, no. Mm. You, you were right about Wigan. They were bottom with 68 games. Aston Villa were top with 102 games. Then Sunderland, 98 games. Newcastle, 97 games. And then it was Wigan with 68 Oh, it just career's just been ruined by a cabbage, hasn't it? <laughs> it really has. That mind. Yeah. <laughs> just going just going back to that then, it literally has just been ruined by a cabbage. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> cabbage heads. Final question is this. Rank these chocolate bars on which one has the most calories? Those chocolate okay. bars are Kit Kat Chunky, Ripple, Snickers, and Twirl. Snickers, uh, it's got caramel, nougat, and nuts in. Nuts are quite fatty, so I'm going to go Snickers top. Then a Kit Kat chunky, a lot of wafer in there. Uh, then no, actually, I'm going to go Snickers top, then a Ripple, okay. then a Twirl, then a Kit Kat chunky. Oh, you're close. Oh you're my close, god! But yeah, you've. Uh... You've made a, a bit of a clangor at the end again. Snickers, you were right. Top, 248 calories. Ooh. Twirl was second with 228. Kit Kat Chunky was third with 207 calories. Then Ripple was 174 calories. Is that it? I yeah, I think Incredible. you have got to take into account that the Ripple is just one long bar. So I suppose... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then in terms of twelve weight. two fingers though. Yeah, exactly. Which is just one uh, just make one bar. Yeah, but twirl is also a bit more condensed, isn't it? I don't well, I, but I suppose Galaxy Ripple, you you pay for a lot of air inside that chocolate. Yeah, there is quite a lot of air, but they are so bloody good. I love a good ripple. Oh <laughs> we can tell. chocolate. You can tell. Uh not very often though. No. A bit boring, me, a bit boring. Bloody vegan. Uh, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. That's been Scott Hire Ryan Lowe. This has been the Second Tier Podcast. And we'll be back again on Sunday to go through all the games in the Championship this coming weekend. And tell you what, I can't bloody wait. So we look forward to seeing you then. This has been the Second Tier Podcast. I've been Ryan Dilks. I've been Justin Peach. And a big thank you for listening. <laughs>